Cool. Um, I think it should be working right now. So, um, yeah. So, welcome everybody who is uh, listening to us on YouTube. Um, it's pretty interesting feeling because uh, this meetup is start has started as a uh, um, you know this off offline uh, um, get together with community, um, and uh, we had quite a bit of like gathering, right? And uh, now um, because of situations that we see the changing in the world, right? Um, I mean, on one hand, uh, as a we had like a short conversation with Alex. Um, it's pretty good opportunity, right? Because you can meet people from completely different, um, you know, locations and have it like way more global event. But from another side, uh, it's also funny because right now I'm sitting in front of, you know, my laptop in a um, single room and um, it's completely different feeling. Like, so I hope you're going to learn something out of this uh, great conversation and uh, um, make it better for our community in general. And I'm like super excited to actually have um, those amazing speakers today. Um, and it's a good combination, I, I think, for especially first event because we have like Alexander here in me. Um, so it's like a local community. And we also have like Sarah, who is uh, like completely on the other side of the ocean. So I'm really like excited to have such opportunity. And the topic from today is also pretty good, right? Because usually when we're talking about machine learning or artificial intelligence, we're more like talking about, um, you know, the models, like some fancy algorithms that could take uh, our uh, results. Um, but sometimes you're also missing to understand what does it mean if you're going to integrate it, right? How can you explain it um, to people who are affected by your solutions, right? Is it um, even like fair to use this uh, like algorithm? Like uh, um, how can you go the extra mile to understand all of that? And today is going to be like entire evening, more on a practical side as well, um, to understand how to use those methods, like where are they helpful? What is actually um, possible right now? And even going like more practical, how you can you know spin up something like in a matter of whatever, like 20 minutes and get results pretty soon. So that's like where Sarah would also show quite a bunch of like really production ready solutions. Um, so where did we start, especially for those of you who are not from Munich and just like happen to get to know about Meta because um, you know, have seen it on the Twitter. We um, called Hacking Machine Learning um, and we based uh, here in Munich or used to be based in Munich when we were doing it offline. And uh, where the name came from that we wanna um, serve machine learning and the aspects of machine learning to the way um, that we are like really um, confident and comfortable with that, right? So it's not only about um, executing some specific uh, task, right? But almost like being a hacker and uh, really you know, being a master of this like subject at the end of the day. Um, and uh, we used to have, or we still use uh, Meetup quite uh, actively as communication platform, meaning like when we are announcing something and uh, you can see our next events also um, uh, by following this link. Um, we have uh, Slack that is not yet um, the most active, but maybe with all this like offline mode, it should be um, growing up a bit more actively. Um, yeah, and um, that's like one of our like offline times when um, we were hosted by different companies here in Munich. In this case, it's like Stylite, and we just like get a gathering to uh, speak about uh, different topics, essentially. Um, yes, and uh, for those of you um, who all of you actually who are watching like on uh, YouTube is basically our first time experiment. Um, and uh, if you have like any feedback, please uh, reach out to me um, and uh, we will try to improve it for the next time. Um, yes, we also will try to um, share the slides afterwards like on um, GitHub um, and uh, from there on you will, yeah get like a bit more of uh, this community. Um, usually on this slide, we, um, you know, appreciating effort of our sponsors, people who host us and uh, um, providing like pizza and beers. Um, and it's also like a good opportunity because um, with uh, such a remote events, um, the cost of actually organizing events is like way lower, right? We don't really need to uh, have locations that can host like 200 people, right? If you can host 200 people online, it's like super easy. But essentially, if you want to support us in any way, please reach out to me and we more than happy to, you know, like help you with uh, your things and also you can help your community. Used to be local community, but maybe now it's also going to be a bit more on a global community. Um, yeah, usually we're also announcing like what is um, next events. So far, since it's like a bit of a, a shaky time, I didn't really have like anything scheduled, but hopefully today is also going to show how open we are um, to such remote and virtual events. And if it goes easy, there's like a bunch of people that I know from all around the globe that would be like super exciting to actually share with you. Because before, if somebody's like uh, based in Portland, 
um, as Hannes, who is like doing like amazing TFX job, it's going to be like pretty hard to bring him um, from US to Germany. But now I think it's just like a couple hours um, or a couple of minutes, basically a couple of clicks away to actually have it all in. So I think we're going to have more um, active events. Um, usually we also promoting um, some of our like friendly events, like conferences and like other events where you can join and uh, get some, uh, you know, um, some knowledge about data science, machine learning topics. Um, and you have seen that like many offline events right now uh, because of safety reasons were canceled. So um, the only thing that we have today here is a Google Summer of Code. So it is an um, amazing opportunity, especially um, if you are a student to get to work with, um, you know, like good mentors from, uh, um, you know, from Google or from um, other organizations as well that are doing like open source. And uh, somebody said, um, as much as like many internships are uh, um, going to be canceled this uh, potentially this summer, but you can still do quite a bunch of like online in open source. So benefit of that is actually going to get bigger and bigger. Um, yeah, with that, I think I'm almost done um, with my talking. The only things I would like to say is that all of this is essentially a community event. Um, so everything that um, you see here is organized by um, people like you are. I mean, if you want to help us uh, um, with anything, meaning like as a content, meaning like you want to speak about some things that you um, experience and you can, um, you know, have a, a four, 40 minutes like long talk or you want to just have something like lightning talk that is just like a small experience that can save somebody um, a bit of time, like please reach out to us. If you want to like volunteer and maybe make this, um, you know, technically this event better or um, anything that you feel like is missing here, also reach out to me and uh, we can make it happen. Um, yes, with that basically just like last uh, organizational uh, point. So as you have seen, um, we are on YouTube and there are like uh, questions. So, um, or like there is a chat on the side. So if you have any questions, please uh, put your questions inside of this chat. And once we're done with the talk of the speakers, we, I will highlight some of those questions. And this way it's not gonna be just, you know, YouTube videos that you can find like many of uh, on YouTube but more actual um, live communication with speakers and with community essentially. So um, with that, I think I'm done. So if you, by any chance, have some questions to me, uh, exactly, <laughs> in virtual pizza, um, please, uh, you know, approach me either like via chat, right, or by meetup or via Twitter or whatever else. And with that, I would uh, um, hand over to our first um, amazing speaker, Alexander, we're going to be talking about um, inter interpretable machine learning and uh, how we can actually, you know, um, understand what's happening and like how to get like better result out of that. Um, yeah, with that, just one second, I will remove my parts and uh, we'll add uh, Alex. And uh, if you would share your screen, Alex, I would also like edit the stream. Yes, sure. Um, da -da -da. Share screen. Okay. <laughs> All right. Hello, everyone. This is based on a presentation I gave at last year's Python conference. And it's essentially a talk on the, the very basics of interpretable machine learning and how to, how to make otherwise black box models explainable. The slides are available on GitHub here. I'll show the link again at the end of the presentation. There is also a blog post on, on my blog on this topic if you want to dive in deeper. And to motivate the, the entire topic, let's say, um, I'd, like to, I'd like to introduce a few problems we have in machine learning models. Essentially, machine learning is good. Of course, we all know that and we like it because machine learning models make decisions automatically, so we don't have to do them. But complex models, black box models, come with a few problems. And we are going to look at three of these problems within this talk and learn three methods to solve these. The first of this First of these problems is the, the problem of fairness. And a nice example is a, a report about a recruiting tool by Amazon that automatically screened CVs and classified them into good or not good. 
the problem was that this recruiting tool favored men. So it penalized, it automatically penalized resumes that included the word women's. This is, of course, not a good thing, and we, we are looking to avoid that. And the second problem is one of understanding. In many disciplines, it's not enough to have a good model. It's not enough to have a model that gives you a super good classification rate, for example. But you actually need to know, you need to extract knowledge from it. You need to know how it works, what, what features are important, how, how the influence of a feature goes. And in these models, uh, in, in these disciplines, sorry, for example, computational biology, bioinformatics or so, uh, a random forest that's super accurate is, is not good enough. We need, we need this knowledge, we need explanations. The third problem is one of explainability and debugging. So in, in February 2019, the, the Polish amend the Polish government published an, a short amendment to a banking law as a direct consequence of the GDPR, or in, in Germany, the DSGVO. And this amendment stated that a data subject, so uh, one, one single person, it should have the right to obtain an explanation of the decision reached. So for example, if one of these Polish customers walks into a bank, and he applies for a loan for a credit and he doesn't get it. He has a right to ask the, the bank, why didn't I get it? And then the bank, of course, has to provide an explanation in, in the case of a negative decision. And a related problem to this, to this explainability idea is one of debugging. If you have a model that is interpretable, you can better audit and debug it. So if you make a false prediction, you can better you can better look into the model and see why why this prediction was made and this is a nice example that visualizes this idea this is from a paper on on a model called lime on an interpretability method called lime and you see here the classification problem was to to see whether a picture is of a husky or of a wolf and this one was wrongly classified as a wolf if you look at the explanation, so if you look at the pixels that were actually important on making this decision, you see that the model was actually trained to recognize snow. And if it sees a picture with a lot of snow, it's going to classify this, this image as a wolf. And this is, of course, bad, or it's probably bad in this classification problem. The solution in this, in this instance I think internet connection is amazing, so maybe we shortly lost uh, Alexander, but I think he's going to be back in a second. Please stay back. <laughs> the part I think is always the most complicated. Is there is like offline event when you do like Wi-Fi and cables and everything else, um, or it's like online. Cool, cool. Bum, ba -dum, bum, bum. Next time, maybe good learning to have some fillers if you have issues with the internet. <laughs> it's actually a good opportunity for different companies, right, to show some advertisement meanwhile. <laughs> But let's see, let's hope if Alex is seeing that. 
Let's give him a couple of minutes. What is your time zone, people? Um, the ones that are watching, maybe you can answer in comments, like what city and what is your time zone right now? Or what time is it in your current location? Why Alexander is still reconnecting? If we can show in here, yay. Hmm. How many people? We have somebody remotely from Prague. It's pretty cool. People from Munich. We have Barton from San Francisco as well. Nice. Pretty cool. Okay, Barbara also from Munich. Okay, so um, let's give a couple of minutes. If he's not coming back, maybe there's some bigger internet issues, and I can check with uh, Sarah if she can jump in a bit early. But it's a good learning. What might be funny um, because I think like how the streaming works usually and how I basically was presenting my part is like you open the presentation mode, right? You have like one screen actually showing what you're gonna see, guys, like as viewers, and one is basically more your speaker notes, right? So essentially, um, it would be like super ridiculous, ridiculous and funny at the same time um, if uh, Alexander is actually not seeing that he's not online, right? And after. Um, all of the situation is because um, he's like skip, keeps talking basically, but um, the stream to <laughs> stream yard is actually got off. So I think I got feedback from Sarah, so she might be joining like a bit early. Sorry for this inconsistency. But we got quite a bit of geography. For those of you um, who are not from Munich, how did you get to know uh, that event is happening? Is it uh, from Sarah's tweet or some some other sources? I don't know, YouTube. You can also answer me in answers. And sorry, in answers, in comments. Next time, I'm going to bring some machine learning jokes for stage cases. <laughs> So I think Sarah would be joining in a second. Maybe good learning. Also have like a mobile phone of the speaker. So in case your internet connection is going off, you can just call it. France, that's pretty good. 
And uh, Tatiana, um, do you have like anybody of speakers who is your friend or somebody from Munich told you? Oh yeah, I think Sarah is coming back. So now I'm um, done with, oh nice. So sorry, you're famous. Like we got all sorts of people joining because of you. Yeah, I'm adding you to the stream. Okay, let me just um, update on Twitter that we're starting now because I told people it was in about 30 minutes. One yeah, yeah, sure. Second. I mean, it's completely fine. And I mean, I completely appreciate that you can even jump in. That seems yeah, like no problem. I like the internet somewhere. <laughs> um, how many people are on? Uh, I think we, let me just check this YouTube right now. Um, we are 26 right now. Um, and maybe there are some, because I think we started is like 27, see? So now it's kind of like growing very slowly. Um, let me just grab the link one sec. Sorry, if yeah, I yeah. just want to make sure no, people no know how to join. I completely appreciate that. Um, I can show something funny so people can. Oh, so like if yeah. you're traveling somewhere, <laughs> you usually need to take a plane, right? But in this case, Sarah got upgraded to the business class. So <laughs> on my couch, it was it was a long trip here from my living room <laughs> to the room I'm in right now. Uh, okay. All right, I think I posted the right link. One second. Okay, I'll retweet it. There we go. Um, okay, let me just make sure my deck is ready to go since we are starting a bit earlier than usual. No worries. I think we're good. Um, so should I go ahead and share my screen? Yeah, if you share it, I will add you to the stream. Basically. Okay. So it's gonna be Okay. Yeah, I think I so I can add you in. And can folks um, just see this one window? Just double checking here. Oops, sorry. We're good. Yeah, maybe I good. If you want, I can also keep you in uh, in the screen, right? Or just your slides. Uh, either works, whichever you prefer. Okay. So Oh, you still there? Yeah, works pretty fine. Yeah, I'm out. Okay, should I get started? Yes, please, go ahead. Okay, all right, sounds good. Um, hey, everyone, I'm excited to be here. This is my first virtual live streamed event, so give me feedback, let me know how it is. Um, should be a learning experience for all of us. Um, I'm going to be talking about explainable AI on Google Cloud. Thanks, Sergey, for having me at your meetup. I think a lot of you are based in Munich which is cool, I've never been there. Hope to travel there someday soon. Um, so my name is Sarah Robinson. I'm a developer advocate on the cloud machine learning team at Google. Uh, for those of you that don't know what a developer advocate does, our job is to teach external audiences like all of you um, about the different tools we have on Google Cloud, get you excited about them. That's through a combination of building demos, giving talks, uh, online content like blog posts, uh, video tutorials. And then we also like to take feedback from all of you and bring that back to the product teams who are building the product. So I focus specifically on machine learning. Um, recently, I've been doing some work with the team building explainable AI. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at srobtweets, and I blog on my personal website, sarahrobinson.dev. Um, so with that, we'll get started. And I'm going to pause um, like after different sections just so we can like go to the comments on the live stream, see if you have any questions that I can take right now. So um, I'm going to start by talking about what the concept of explainability is, why it's important, um, how, it, how it fits into the machine learning workflow. And then finally, we'll get into using explainable AI, which is a new tool that we offer on Google Cloud to interpret your models. Uh, and Sergey, since I can't see the chat, feel free to just interrupt if there's a question that you think I should take in the moment. Uh, so we'll start with the definition. So this is how I like to define explainability. It's a process of understanding how and why a machine learning model is making predictions. Um, this affects two different groups of people. So it happens both at the model builder, uh, which is us, data scientists, machine learning engineers, building models, and the model end user level. And I'm going to talk about both of those in a moment. Uh, before we get into the details, 
Um, let's see what explainability actually looks like for different types of data modalities. So for an image model, what explainability can do is it can highlight the individual pixels on an image that signaled the model's prediction the most. Um, so this is a model that predicts animal breeds, and we can see for the bird, um, the red pixels are the highest signal to the model. So it's able to pick up on the shape of this bird's beak. Um, and then for the meerkat, it's able to understand the, the small dark eyes. So in this case, we're using explainability, kind of like sanity check that our model is picking up on the right signals. Um, so instead of the pixels that were highlighted were you know, randomly separated or in the background, we might want to then go back to our training data and see how we can improve it. Um, here's what it looks like for text models. So these are two different examples. The example on the top is a model that uh, predicts the genre of a movie given its description. So here the highest signal words are in blue. Um, so we can see the words that led this model to predict action. Um, so we have mission, learns, and kill. And the second example um, on the bottom is more of a fairness example of how explainability can help ensure that your model is not biased. So um, if you have a model that's doing, let's say, sentiment analysis, predicting whether a specific piece of text is positive or negative, um, this can help you make sure that the model isn't using identity terms to determine the sentiment analysis. So what I mean by that is, let's say I'm describing myself. Um, I'm based here in Boston, Massachusetts, um, on the East Coast in the US. And so if I were to say, like, I'm a Red Sox fan, that's our local baseball team. Um, we wouldn't want the sentiment analysis value to be more or less than I'm a Yankees fan, though some may disagree. Um, but you can kind of see how this would play out on um, you know, more controversial identity terms. So explainability can help you make sure that your model is using the right signals to make its prediction. Um, and then finally, what does this look like for models trained on tabular data? So this is a model that predicts the duration of a bike trip, given some data on the trip. Um, so what you get for tabular data models is you get feature attribution values. So that tells you how much each particular feature impacted the model's final prediction. In this case, it looks like um, temperature of the time when the person took the bike trip was the most important feature. Um, so why is it important to end users? Um, so the example on the top left is um, a model that identifies diabetic retinopathy, which is um, a condition that can lead to blindness if not caught early. So they take, um, this model was built by a bunch of um, teams at Google, a lot of researchers working on this problem of um, diabetic retinopathy analysis. Um, so if this model is then given to, let's say like a doctor or someone at a medical facility, um, and they just get the classification back, let's say, you know, for this example, this picture is contains mild diabetic retinopathy. Um, it's hard for them to have confidence in that classification without knowing exactly you know, why the model predicted mild. So um, what explainability can do, as it does in this case, is it highlights the lesions on the eye that cause the model to predict mild DR. Um, other examples, let's say you're getting a recommendation, you might want to know like why a particular thing was recommended to you. Um, and then finally, credit score. Um, which is a financial metric that we use in the US. Um, if you get you know, a good or a bad credit score, credit score you probably wanna know what caused that score and what you can do to improve it. Um, so now that we kind of have a good understanding of explainability, let's talk about why it's important. So here we have a model that finished training and it got 99% accuracy. Um, so a lot of people would say, you know, that's great. Let's deploy the model, it's ready to go. Um, but accuracy is actually only one piece of the picture when you're, when you're thinking about model evaluation. Um, explainability is another important piece. So accuracy is like really only one lens to look at how well your model's performing. So explainability kind of helps you uncover, you know, the black box behind machine learning models. And as I mentioned before, it's important to two different groups of people, which I've, I've touched on a bit already. Um, for model builders, for us people building these machine learning models, it can help us um, identify biases in the model's behavior. And it can also help us see how um, maybe our data set's imbalanced and this is influencing the way that the model's making classifications. So let's say you're training model on uh, any type of demographic data to predict something, um, but turns out for one's age demographic slice in your data set, you have only a very small number of examples. So the way that your model is behaving on people that belong to that slice um, may not be accurate or how it should be making predictions for that group of people. So it can help you understand um, how you need to make changes to your data set 
and it can also lead um, to improvements in accuracy. So for end users, um, you can surface this data to your users if it makes sense for your use case to help you understand why um, an individual data point received a particular prediction. And you might also have um, you know, regulators, any type of external stakeholder that you might need to you know, present a summary of your model to, explainability can help with that as well. Um, so this is a typical machine learning workflow. And um, I'm going to talk about how explainability can fit into various stages of this. You know, when I first was looking at explainability, my initial thought is like something you do once and you're done. Uh, but it's actually something you should be continuously thinking about throughout the uh, machine learning life cycle. So the first thing you can do before you even build or train a model is identify data set imbalances. There's lots of tools that can help you do, you know, data set analysis, um, analysis on different slices of your data. Um, this can help you work out any data set problems before you start building. So once you train the model, um, after you've run training and evaluation, there are some tools you can use, and I'll talk about some of these later on, um, to ensure that your model is treating all groups of users fairly. It kind of relates back to the age demographic example that I, that I talked about before. Um, another thing you can do is use some tools to help you set prediction thresholds. Um, so what are prediction thresholds? Um, let's say you've got a model that is predicting whether or not an image contains a cat, um, and your model returns 80% 80, 80 confidence, um, and you decide 80% is, is okay. So if the model returns 80% confidence that this is a cat, then show the end user, yes, it's a cat. 80% is probably okay in that case. In the case of, let's say, like a medical example, or maybe you're doing something like visual inspection on an assembly line, um, you probably want way closer to 99% accuracy. So those are prediction thresholds. Um, finally, when your model is deployed, um, chances are that the data that your, that your users are sending to your model is gonna be slightly different than um, the data you use to train and test it. So just you know, doing a, a similar analysis again to make sure that um, your model is behaving correctly on real world data. Um, and then finally, you can surface the prediction analysis to end users or summarize it to stakeholders um, if that's something you want to do. So just to summarize all the points I just made, you know, a nice little diagram. Again, it's a continuous process. So, you know, you'll most likely have new training data coming in. You'll be retraining your model. Um, you can repeat this process whenever you do that. Just good things to think about. Um, so now getting to the part about GCP, and I'll pause on, uh, after this slide. I'm going to talk about our explainable AI offering, which we launched um, last November at Google Cloud Next London. Um, explainable AI is a suite of tools um, available in different products, right now available in two different products on Google Cloud, uh, to help you interpret and understand your model predictions. Um, so this is a pyramid that represents almost all of our machine learning offerings on Google Cloud. Um, and it's organized by levels of abstraction. So the tools towards the bottom are targeted more at data scientists, machine learning engineers. Um, I would say that applies to like AI platform and below here. Um, the tools in the top half are targeted more towards application developers, folks that have not as much machine learning experience, um, but want an easy way to add machine learning to their application. Um, so I'm not gonna talk about all of these different products, um, but I will highlight the two that um, we support explainable AI on right now. I have a video on YouTube that goes through this whole pyramid if you want to check it out. Um, I can share a link in the chat at the end if folks are interested. Um, so first, AI platform. I like to think of this as our one-stop shop for all things custom model. Um, so we provide infrastructure to help you train your model. Um, you can deploy your model and then access it um, through the AI platform prediction API. Um, your model can auto scale or you can set up manual scaling so that some nodes are always on. Um, so AI platform prediction is currently where uh, one place where explainable AI is supported um, right now on TensorFlow models. Um, so AI platform supports a bunch of different model types. Um, right now this explainability feature is enabled for TensorFlow models. Um, so when you deploy your TensorFlow models, you get these attribution values back. And I'll show you uh, a demo of what that actually looks like in a moment. Um, and then finally, AutoML. Um, AutoML is also a suite of products um, that lets you train and serve custom models without requiring you to write any of that model code yourself. Um, so you upload your training data to a UI, you press a train button, and then your model is immediately available um, for serving, and you can get predictions via an API. AutoML has a bunch of different variants for different types of data. 
Um, so AutoML tables is our AutoML product for tabular data. Um, so any type of data you might find in a spreadsheet, like numerical, categorical data, um, you get explainability by default when you train and deploy a uh, model in AutoML tables. So I'm going to pause for a moment. Sergey, is there any questions that I should take? No, so far, there is like no, no questions. So we can just continue. No questions? The next one. OK. Yeah. All right, sounds good. Um, so this is what explanations looks like on AutoML tables. So what we see on the top right, um, AutoML tables gives you both global and instance level predictions. Um, we see global here on the top. So this is for your model overall, um, which features were the most important. So this is going back to that um, the bike model that I talked about before, predicting the duration of a bike trip. Um, so here we're seeing that Euclidean, which is a dis uh, feature that measures the distance of the trip, is the most important feature, followed by day of the week. Um, what we see on the bottom right is um, instance level attribution values. So AutoML tables also gives you, um, let's say you want to send one test example for prediction and you want to see for that particular trip which features are most important. Um, you can get that as well. So you see that on the local feature importance on the right. Um, and the UI is just a quick way to test out predictions, but uh, you also get access to an API for, and you can get these feature importance values back through the API. Um, here's some examples of what it looks like on AI platform. So it works with uh, image, text, and tabular models, uh, TensorFlow models that are deployed on cloud AI platform. Uh, you get your explanations through the API. It supports two different uh, explanation methods based on some public research. I'll share some links to those papers out uh, later on. And it integrates directly with, with what's called the what-if tool. Um, the what-if tool is an open source tool um, developed by the pair team at Google. Um, they're actually based out here in, in Massachusetts, same office as me. Um, this lets, helps you understand how your machine learning model is performing. It has a bunch of different features. It works with any model type, uh, not just TensorFlow, not just Cloud AI Platform, but they do have some special features for uh, explanation models deployed on AI Platform. Um, so to deploy your model on AI Platform, this is how it works. So you build your model as you normally would uh, in TensorFlow. No changes to that part. Um, then you deploy your model using either um, G Cloud, which is the Google Cloud CLI, or um, the AI Platform API. You can use the API to get predictions. You can also debug your predictions in a notebook um, using AI Platform and the What If tool. Um, I mentioned we support two explanation methods. So these are the ones that we support right now. The first is integrated gradients, which you can use for um, model training on any different type of data. The paper link is right there. Um, integrated gradients was developed by a team at Google, um, sampled Shapley, um, another popular explanation technique. Um, if any of you have used the open source framework SHAP, um, our, the sampled Shapley explanation method here is similar to that. Um, definitely recommend checking out SHAP if you haven't already. It's a great way to get started with um, explainability and it's open source. Um, so with that, let's go to a demo. Um, first, I'm going to show you AutoML tables. Can everybody see my screen? Yeah, cool. you can see. Okay. Awesome. Um, so this is what AutoML tables UI looks like. So you upload your data. It'll infer the data type. Um, you tell it the target column, the thing you're predicting. In this case, it's duration. Um, you can see we've got lots and lots of data here. This is all based on a public data set. Um, my teammate Amy built this demo, and we what we did was we joined um, public data on bike share trips in London with um, a public table that's available in BigQuery with NOAA weather data to see you know, if weather and a number of other factors influence the bike trip. Um, so to train your model, you just press this button. You tell it how many compute hours you want it to use for training, which features to use, uh, and you press train. So um, once your model's done training, you get access to some evaluation metrics, including feature importance, um, which I talked about earlier. So this is global model level feature importance. Um, all of these uh, should add up to 100. So we can see here that Euclidean is um, distance is the most important feature. Um, finally, to use this model, uh, I'm going to demo online prediction. I think on oops, on this version is deployed. Um, so online prediction you can do right through the UI. Um, I mean, most likely you'll want to use the API, but the UI is a great way to test it. Um, it'll auto-populate some random values from your data set in here. 
and you just need to check this generate feature importance box and you'll get access to uh, feature importance values. There we go. Um, I think this model is predicting in seconds, not minutes. And here we can see that um, the distance for this trip caused um, the model prediction to go up. Um, up from what? It, it actually is all relative to this baseline prediction value. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in my next demo on AI platform. So this location cross feature um, caused the model's prediction to be pushed down from the baseline. We can see the results for other features as well. Um, so that's what this looks like in AutoML tables. Um, next, I want to show AI platform. So I'm going to show this from AI Platform Notebooks, which is our hosted Jupyter Notebook solution on AI Platform. Um, this is what the UI looks like. And I have, oops, I have a notebook instance open. One sec. There we go. OK, so I'm going to run some stuff in this notebook um, to call two models that I have deployed on AI Platform with explanations, one image model um, and one tabular model, similar tabular model to what you saw before. Um, so we're, we'll import some libraries. The first uh, example that we're going to see um, is a flower classification model. So pretty simple, just classifies images of flowers into one of these five labels. Um, so first, let's look at our prediction without explanations. And we see, you know, pretty straightforward. It's able to predict these flowers correctly. And um, now let's see why our model predicted these classes. Um, so what we get back here is um, what explanations re the service returns um, is a base64 encoded version of your image with these pixels highlighted. Um, by default, it um, returns the top 60% of pixels that signaled your model's uh, prediction for a particular label. Um, so again, here we're using it to verify that our model is picking up on the right signals in the image. In this case, it's able to identify the shape of these flowers. Um, another image example, I'm not going to be pinging the model live for this one, but I just wanted to show um, what a response for um, the diabetic retinopathy example that I talked about before would look like. So I'm going to show you an image that we did send through our explanation service. Um, so first, here's the image without explanations. Um, this is an image that should be flagged as proliferative DR, which is the worst form. Um, and here we can see uh, the explanations that were returned from our model. So our model is, our explanations are able to identify the areas that caused our model to um, classify this as proliferative. And so these are indeed the correct areas. I'm not a medical professional, but I verified this with the doctor. Um, so that's kind of a quick example of, of how you can use image explanations on um, Cloud AI platform. Um, and then I'm going to talk about uh, tabular data using the same example as before, but um, the highlight here is I want to show you how it integrates with the what if tool. So these are the different features that we're using to train this model. Again, we're predicting um, bike trip duration. And here's what a single example looks like. We're going to send this example to our model in a moment. So the trip duration for this example is 11. Um, we can see the rest of the features here. The temperature is in Celsius, 24 hour time. Um, so let's send our um, example to our model for prediction and see what it predicted. So it looks like it predicted 10.7 uh, minutes, which is pretty close. Actual duration was 11. Uh, without explanations, we don't know why it predicted that. Um, so, you know, let's say we're building an app and maybe we want to surface this data to our users to say, like, we anticipate your bike trip will take this long based on the time of day and, you know, the fact that it's really cold today. So let's look at the feature attribution values that we get back from AI platform. Um, so these feature attribution values are all relative to our model's baseline prediction. Um, now, when you deploy your models for explanations on AI platform, you need to choose your baseline. Um, the baseline essentially says, what should all of these attributions be relative to? So for this particular example, um, for the baseline, I just took the median value across all of my features. So the baseline prediction is going to be the same for every example I sent to my model. Since this is a regression model, it's predicting a numerical value. So 13.61 is my baseline prediction. That's what my model predicted for the median across all of my input features. That approach, um, using the median across all of my training data, is called an uninformative baseline. 
um, I'll tell you what an informative baseline looks like um, when we go back to the slides. So since our predicted duration is less than the baseline, we should expect most of these values to be negative, um, which they are, and this should all add up to the difference. Um, so it looks like distance, again, is our most important feature. It is causing our model's prediction to decrease by about two and a half minutes. Uh, the start hour of the trip caused the model's predicted duration to decrease by about a minute, and we see other features ranked by their importance. Um, so, you know, we're able to kind of see this here sorted by absolute value, but it'd be nice if there was a better way to visualize these attributions. So that's where um, the what if tool comes in really handy. So you can run the what if tool in pretty much any type of notebook, Colab, uh, AI platform notebooks, it comes pre-installed, your local Jupyter environment. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm sending the what if tool uh, 500 examples for my test data set. And this is all the code I need to um, spin up this visualization. I tell it the name of my project, my model, my version, um, pass it my test data, set the target feature, and we're ready to go. So let me make this just a little bit smaller so that it all fits in the window. Um, so what we see here on the x-axis is the predicted duration for all of these test data points. Uh, there's nothing on the y-axis. It's just kind of you know spreading out these values. Um, so let's look at one particular data point here. So when we click on a data point, um, the what if tool lets us see all of the features for that particular example, in addition to all of the attribution values that we get from AI platform. Now again, this is only for models that you've deployed on AI platform with explanations. Um, something really cool about the what if tool is you can change the feature values and then rerun the prediction and see what happens. Um, so we can see this model, this data point's actual duration was 19 minutes, our model predicted 22-ish, pretty close. So um, if I change the temperature to, let's say, like 8 degrees Celsius, rerun prediction, um, we can see that caused my model's predicted duration to decrease by nearly three minutes. I can try, um, let's cut the distance in half and see what happens next. And that has a big effect on our model. Um, it causes the predicted trip duration to go down even more by about nine minutes. Um, so you can create all sorts of cool custom visualizations here. Um, I won't go into that now, but um, you could sort data points by their attribution value, um, by the strength of their attribution value, really tons of different types of customizations available there. Um, you can also do what's called partial dependence plots. Um, so these show you how individual features affected the model's prediction. So here we can see an inverse relationship between dew point and our model's predicted trip duration. Um, some performance features here. If you, if you load the what if tool with the classification model, um, it also gives you some access to some fairness tools. So when I talked about prediction thresholds before, um, that's something you can do in the what if tool. Um, makes more sense for classification models. And then finally, you get um, you can see how balanced your data set is. Um, so this shows you what your what the data set you've sent the what if tool. So for these 500 data points, I can see what the range of data looks like for all my different features. Um, and you actually get access to this tab. Um, even if you don't have a model and you just want to see you know, the distribution of your data, you can instantiate the what-if tool without passing it a model at all, just passing it your data, um, and it will show you this. So that's a quick preview of the what-if tool integration. Um, I'm going to go back to the slides. Actually, let me pause for a moment to see if there's questions. Sergey, any questions? Yeah, we got quite some questions. I can actually highlight them. So can you, can you see the screen right there? Um, if I go to StreamYard, should I open it up on YouTube? Um, I may either open on YouTube, but I can read it out. So one question is from um, Jonas, I, I believe that's how I pronounce it. Will there okay. be explanation for video data, sequence of images, example for a classification? So for instance, you showed us uh, you know, flowers. If you would put a video of flowers, would it also like highlight some frames? That's a really good question. Um, explanations for video data. Um, I haven't tried that, um, I so I'm not sure if it's supported right now, but um, would be happy to chat with you after if you have a video use case. Um, feel free to message me on Twitter. Um, mm -hmm. I'll put my S Rob tweets. I'll put my Twitter handle up here while while I'm taking questions. Yeah. Um, and we can yeah we can chat more about about your use case. 
Yeah. So next question was uh, from actually me, but in general, are there like any limitations? So let's say, do you fully support TensorFlow 2.0? Are there like any layer limitations? Let's say if model has like one of the layers with TensorFlow probability, like where do you draw the line? What is supported? What is not? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so right now we only support TensorFlow 1 models. Um, we are working on improving that because I know a ton of people are, are now moving to TensorFlow 2. Um, so yeah, that's the current level of support, um, just TensorFlow models and um, also AutoML tables. Great yeah. question. More questions? Another one from Michael, uh, what algorithm do you use for computing feature importance? And they say the presentation is amazing. Glad you like it. Thank you. Um, what algorithm do we use for computing feature importance? So that it relates back to the explanation methods that I talked about here. Um, so we use these for um, depending on which one you specify. And you can specify this when you deploy your model. And this is one way you can deploy your model using G Cloud, the Google Cloud CLI. So you specify the explanation method here. Um, I'm not going to get into detail on these specific approaches, but um, both of these papers are actually pretty readable. Um, so highly recommend checking them out. We also have a white paper. I'll skip to the link slide here um, that the team wrote. Um, you should definitely check this out. This white paper is awesome. Um, I've made a bit.ly link to it here. That goes into detail on um, explanation methods and feature importance. That should answer your question. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Yeah, the last one. Um, so the question is like, hey, the platform looks amazing. Like, ha has it been used also for coronavirus cases? Um, because currently it's like really um, on top here. Yeah. That's a really good question. Um, is actually something you know we'd like to help with if you're doing that. I'm just going to skip around a bunch because I do have a slide about this. Um, so if you're not familiar with Kaggle, um, Kaggle is an awesome data science platform. Um, they are part of Google. Um, they have, in addition to lots of great data sets, they have um, what's called challenges. So this was a challenge that was created on Kaggle in collaboration with the Allen AI Institute, the NIH, the White House, a couple of other organizations. Um, there's a few challenges actually. So there's one NLP related. Um, there's one that's more of a predictive modeling challenge. Um, and you know, keep on the lookout if, as they update those. Um, so if you are a data scientist, want to contribute your skills to helping with COVID-19 research, um, definitely consider contributing to this challenge. And to answer your question, um, if anybody is using uh, TensorFlow for these models or other models, um, and you'd like help um, using explainability with, uh, with your coronavirus research, um, I would love to help you out. Others on my team would as well. Um, we can also give you access to cloud resources at no charge mm -hmm. if you're doing COVID-19 research. So um, yeah, please follow up with me on Twitter if that's something you're doing and you'd like help with. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Cool, I think that's for now all questions. We can continue and after see like if more are gonna pop up because YouTube is okay. also like a good 10 seconds maybe uh, behind us. So like one okay. second, we're gonna be later, yeah. Okay, one sec. My parents were gonna watch this talk. Um, <laughs> they thought it started on the hour, so I just told them they should tune in now. Maybe yeah, they'll sure. say hi. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I don't have too much more, but I will go back to the slides and maybe some more questions will pop up. Um, I want to dive in a bit to the topic of baselines and how you can select those. Um, so um, I talked about baseline is, is relative to your attribution values are all relative to this baseline prediction value. Um, I talked a bit about that with the, the bike model prediction. So. Baseline explainability is all about explaining, you know, why did X event happen? X could be why did the model say this is a cat? In that case, we'd see the, hi the highlighted pixel values. Um, why did I get rejected from this loan? Why did this transaction get flagged as fraud? I have another demo that I'm not going to show today um, that goes into detail on building and explaining a fraud detection model. Um, but it's a good use case for talking about baselines. So I'm trying to explain why a specific transaction got flagged as fraud. My baseline is why did X happen instead of um, some other event that was supposed to happen? So instead of Y, where Y is the baseline. So we have this concept of uninformative versus informative baselines. Um, uninformative baselines are typically used in image models that you don't have to. So for an image model, a common baseline would be a solid black or a solid white image um, or an image with random pixel values. So you could just do np.random 
create a random array of pixel values and use that as your baseline. Um, and another example of uninformative baseline is, you know, what I did for the bike model, just get the median of all the feature values across my entire data set. Um, an informative baseline is based on a specific condition, that Y condition that you define. So in the case of fraud detection, you want to say, you know, why did this transaction get flagged as fraud instead of non-fraudulent? So in the case of this example, I really only care about explaining transactions that my model flagged as fraud. I don't care as much about explaining transactions it flagged as non-fraudulent. Um, so the way that I chose the baseline for this example is I took, um, I separated my data, my training data set out. I took all the non-fraudulent examples and then I took the median on those values and then used that as the baseline. So the baseline prediction for this model turned out to be um, like 1%. Uh, predicted chance of fraud, which is a good baseline because I really care about explaining those cases that had, you know, a 99% chance of predicted fraud. Um, so that's how I calculated the baseline for the fraud example. And then for categorical features that have a string value, I just took uh, like the type of transaction was one of the features. So I just took um, the most commonly occurring transaction type from the non-fraudulent data set and used that as the baseline. Uh, for AutoML tables, you don't need to specify the baseline. It'll take care of computing that for you. Um, and it's definitely worth experimenting with different baseline values to see what gets you um, the results that you want. So for this example, you know, I could have also tried, um, you know, as a comparison point to get the baseline on every value in my training data. Um, but I chose this approach and, and it works pretty well. Um, other things I have here. So uh, a little bit more on the what if tool. This is what the what if tool looks like for a classification model. Um, this one shows the census data set, which a lot of you are probably familiar with, um, just predicting you know, whether someone's income is greater than or less than 50K. Um, the what if tool also lets you do counterfactual analysis. Um, so what that means is you can highlight a particular data point and then you can see, um, show me the data point that's most similar to this, but led to the opposite prediction by my model. And then it'll show those both of those uh, data points for you on the left, and it'll highlight the differences. It can just kind of, you know, help you understand a bit more about how your model's performing. I think I mentioned this before, but you can use um, the what if tool on many different uh, notebook platforms. Colab is a great tool. Use it all the time. Definitely recommend checking out Colab if you haven't yet. It's totally free, browser-based Python notebook. Um, AI platform notebooks, if you use a TensorFlow instance type, it comes pre-installed. Um, local Jupyter, TensorBoard, um, it also supports model comparison. I think we're sh we show that in this screenshot. So you can compare two models. Um, you know, let's say I build a TensorFlow model and a scikit-learn model with the same data set, and I want to see how they're performing. I can compare them in the what-if tool. Um, we saw attribution values, and then we saw that demo. Um, that kind of concludes most of my presentation, um, but I'd be happy to stay on and take questions. I'll leave this slide up for a bit. Um, if you want to learn more, some great resources, um, ones that I'll call out. So I have some demo notebooks showing tabular and image models. Um, this goes to GitHub, uh, the white paper. Definitely worth a read if you want to learn more about the what if tool. And then the fraud detection example that I briefly talked about. Um, oops, what happened there? Um, is available here. Um, I have a whole code lab that walks you through all the steps of building that model, explaining it. Um, and I'd love to hear from you if you um, have a use case we don't support, if you try out the what, uh, what if tool integration or explainable AI on its own and have feedback, um, I can share that with the team. And um, you know, if, if you'd like us to you know, work with your company on um, a use case you have that you think would be a good fit for this tool, would be happy to chat. So yeah, open to your feedback, uh, especially since it's a fairly new product. We'd like to see how people are using it or how people want to use it. Um, and then I'll give one more call out to this as well. Please check out the Kaggle challenge um, if you're doing um, coronavirus research and you know interested in contributing your data science skills. Um, with that, let's take some more questions if there are. Are there any on the line, yeah. Sergey? I, I've got a couple of questions. Um, okay. About uh, explainability for NLP, um, do, do you support that? Because like Lime, for instance, does support, and also I don't know how far you go. Like, is it that you supporting like Bird and I don't know activations and all the things or yeah. Yeah. Um, 
personally, I haven't done as much experimentation with um, the natural language model support on a platform. We do support it if you build your model in TensorFlow. Um, if you have questions about it or like want to try it out together, um, let me know because we definitely support you know TensorFlow models that do text classification. Um, right now, I think classification would be the main use case that's supported. Um, so yeah, if you have a use case, let me know. Yeah, makes sense. Another one would be um, I see like more people using TensorFlow JS and even the training like uh, on device with TF Lite and some additional layers. Do you see, obviously like it's pretty um, not common, right? And uh, but in the future, do you see it something that also could be potentially part of platform or it's like very niche use case and not yet um, in the close future? That's a really good question. So the question is around um, explaining models built with TensorFlow JS. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there's not a way to do that right now um, unless you could export your TF. I haven't played with TFJS in a while. Um, if you can export those as a TensorFlow saved model, um, then you could get explanations on cloud. Um, mm -hmm. Not sure if you can do that, uh, but that's definitely um, a great feature request, um, something I can pass along to the team. Uh, you may also want to check out SHAP, um, the open source yeah. framework. They may be able to support that type of model. Nice, it's very good. And another one is kind of related to support and everything what you mentioned. How can people contribute? Open source, send your feedback via Twitter. What is a good channel? And uh, yeah, how to get involved in this is amazing topic. Um, that's a really good question. How can you get involved? Um, so this is not open source, though it is based on public research. So let me just highlight that explanation method slide again. Where did that go? There we go. Um, so it is based on publicly available research. The product itself is not open source. Um, but if you'd like to get involved, if you have questions, if you want to present on it um, at you know a local, I guess virtual meetup these days, um, the best way is probably just um, ping me on Twitter, and I can get you in touch with the right folks. I know it's not a super scalable approach, but I can try to triage the requests to the right people. So that's probably the best approach for now. Yeah, sounds good. Um, we also got uh, Steve Robinson who is saying that the presentation is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dad. My, my parents are, are tuning in from Chicago. So hi, mom and dad. Thanks for joining the stream. Nice. And uh, another one is, uh, again, from uh, um, from Jonas uh, asking about TensorFlow graphics layers, 3D camera lighting material. Is there any plans to also add support of TensorFlow graphics? I myself do not know about TensorFlow graphics, um, but I will check it out, and I can let you know. Um, is that part of TensorFlow 2? or a new feature? I think it's like a separate uh, project within TensorFlow. Oh, a separate library. Yeah. OK. Um, yeah, I'm not familiar with that. But um, thank you for pointing it out to me. I'll check it out. Nice. I think with that, we kind of done these questions. Um, it was amazing to have you. And uh, I think audience really enjoyed uh, all the amazing context that you provided. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, great first virtual meetup experience. If anyone has feedback you know, on the format, when to you know stop and ask, take questions. Would love to hear it as I'm as I think we all are kind of new to this virtual event format. So yeah, definitely. Would love to hear what you all thought. Yeah, I, sh I shared the Twitter as well. So hopefully people will follow and also like ask the questions and uh, spread the news basically from you as well. Okay, cool. Yeah, and I also be curious if people would be interested in like a live coding live stream. You know, like starting with an empty notebook, deploying a model to XAI live. I've toyed with the idea of doing that, though I don't know if I've built up the courage to live code on a live stream yet, but I'm yeah. getting there. I, mean, I think it's a good idea because, I mean, essentially, um, it's a good safe uh, playground, right? Because we're not, you know, like thousands of people, we're more like 30. I think like it was like where are we going right now? Um, mm -hmm. So we would be like super happy, like if you have some idea or scope what you want to show, you can just like discuss about dates and see from there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, awesome. I think with that, we okay, will just great. wrap it up with you. Thank you again. Uh, round of virtual applause for you. Thanks. <laughs> and, uh, Thanks for around. hosting, Sergey. Really appreciate yeah. it. Stay safe and uh, see you next time. Bye. You too. Cool. Um, that was an amazing talk by Sarah. Um, you, as I said, you can follow her on Twitter, and um, she's an amazing person, like doing amazing demos. And uh, we finally got back to Alexander. Um, it's actually funny because, like, once I was like trying to fill in the gaps. I was like, hey, you know what might be happening? Maybe Alex still going with his talk. 
and he just doesn't know if like it was broken or not, right? And after you wrote me like on Twitter that well, that was exactly the case. So <laughs> I would definitely keep it as, as a learning for next time that I don't know, maybe we need to exchange the numbers, like or we do some kind of like uh, um, way to communicate. But yeah, it's great that you were able to make it back, basically. Yeah, thanks. I I completely screwed up. I think no other words. I, I mean, find... you with the internet and the so it's some way to to see if I'm if I'm still online or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So but we're all um, learning, right? Exactly. So it's a great learning opportunity, and we all only mm -hmm. getting outside of that. So if you would uh, share your screen, I can bring you back basically. So. All right. And I kind of love it actually. It's a good new alternative. <laughs> yes, okay, I'm I sharing my screen. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, I've checked when I was when I was dropping out and it was very much at the beginning still. So I'm going to skip the short introduction. We were talking about three problems. Three problems in machine learning. And the first one was the problem of fairness. So We've heard about a, a recruiting tool by Amazon that has essentially um, favored or penalized resumes that included the word women's. This is a problem that we want to abolish. The second problem is one of understanding. So in disciplines like computational biology, we, we don't only want a good classification accuracy, but we also want, uh, to, want, want to know why, why a specific prediction happens. And the third problem, this is where my connection dropped, is the one of explainability and related to that, the debugging. So the Polish government published an amendment to a banking law, which said that if a person applies for a loan and then it gets rejected, it should have the right to, to obtain an explanation. So it can ask the bank, why, why didn't you give me the loan? And this is also a problem which we're going to look at a, a method to solve that. Very much related to that is the idea of debugging, of debugging your own model. So this is an example from, from the paper called Why Should I Trust You? It's a method called LIME is implemented in there. And this is the classification problem of tasking or of classifying this picture into either husky or wolf. And in this case, it is a husky that wrongly got classified as a wolf. And if you look at the explanation, if you look at which, which pixels are actually important for that, you'll see that this model has really just learned to recognize snow. So if, if there's snow in the picture, it's going to classify this thing as a wolf. And this helps you a lot because now you can debug your model. And oops, in, in this case, the solution is to get more training examples of huskies with snow in the background. All of these three problems can, can lead us to this one lesson that we need to better understand our models. We need to see under the hood and, and understand them or get, get a feeling of how they work, how they come to their conclusions. And in this talk, I'm going to introduce you to three different methods, each of which solve one of these problems we've just looked at. The field, the name I'm using is interpretable machine learning. You'll also hear the word explainable AI. The previous talk, I think, used explainable AI. And I'm using these as synonyms. Uh, there are other people who, who see a difference in that, but it's still a very young field and it changes quickly. So there are still papers coming out at high speed. So the terminology is, is still not yet unified. Everyone or different people call things by different names because it's a very young field. But you'll hear both of these both of these terms describing what I think is the same idea. My talk is based on this book by Christoph Molnar. He's a, also a Munich-based guy who's given a similar talk on, on the Munich Data Geeks, if you've been there. His book is available for free here. And he's also written an R package who is which is implementing all of uh, many of these methods. If, if you have a lot of free time and want to work on a personal project, porting this to Python would be great, I think. But this book I can I can recommend a lot. All the methods I'm I'm explaining are in there also. It's as I said, it's available for free here. 
uh, very nice, very nice book. So what do you do if you want to understand your model? Essentially, you have two options. The first one is to use a model that is already inherently interpretable. And the second option is to use a black box model. So to use a complex model and at the first, or you don't really care about interpreting it now, but after that, so after having trained your model, you run a separate method that is called a post hoc method to interpret it, to understand its, its choices and decisions. The first option I just mentioned is to use an interpretable model. And the first thing you always hear or learn is a linear regression, right? It's a nice first baseline. Another idea is a decision tree, which is better when, when you have nonlinear effects or maybe interactions. And these methods are simple for the for the simple reason that they're heavily constrained. So they are usually not able to, to capture reality in, in its entirety. They were okay earlier in the 80s when you had a medical data set with 30 treatment and 30 control people. Then a t-test is fine, right? But as we get more and more data, the underperformance of these methods grows and gets worse. So we need black box models to, to just capture all of that knowledge in the data. And so we arrive at the second option. We're using a black box model. And then after that, we're, we're using a separate method to interpret this model. And by black box, I mean, I define it as a model that you can't understand by just looking at the parameters. For a linear or a logistic regression, it's relatively easy. You can explain the, the model to someone else by, by looking at the parameters and explaining these. But for a neural network or other black box models, it's not so easy anymore. You can't just look at a million parameters, right? Um, and unless you're a cipher from the matrix, then maybe if you, if you dream in code, you can see that. And what we're going to focus here is uh, model agnostic methods, which means it's a model or a method that doesn't care which model was used in the beginning. And this is a super nice advantage. This means that we can swap out the model as we want. We can retrain it. We can use a completely different algorithm. But the interpretability method stays the same, and it doesn't care. And on the same note, we can change out the interpretability method without changing the model if we want to look at different plots or different things. This makes them very flexible and makes them a very nice, the whole class of methods makes them a very nice idea. And the basic idea they do is they, they all work in a similar way. You leave the model as it is, you don't change it or retrain it, but you only play around with the input data. So for example, you take one column, one feature, and you just shuffle it. You permute this one column and then send it through the model again. And with the change data, you're going to measure the changes in the predicted output. So how much does the prediction suffer if you, if you play around with your data? <clears throat> I'm going to explain three methods. And the, the sample data set I'm using is the bike sharing data set, which was first made public on Kaggle, I think. I've aggregated it. I've made it a bit simpler and aggregated it to daily averages. And if you don't know, I'll just briefly go over the data set. The idea is to predict for a small company that rents out bikes, um, to predict how many bikes they're going to rent out on, on each specific day. In, in this case, 3,900. Um, the input features that you're using is, for example, the season. And the year, this was a this company was growing strongly between 11 and 12 here. So in 2011, they're renting out fewer bikes in 2012 more. Um, things about the, the work day or the weekday, if it's a working day, if it's a holiday, the weather and the temperature and the humidity are very important. We also have the field temperature, so how, how warm or how cold it actually feels and the wind speed. So there's a few categorical and a few um, continuous variables or features. I'll be using two models because it's very nice and very visual to, to explain some of the methods with a linear model. I'm training one of those. 
And I'm also training a random forest just to, to have a, what, what I call the black box model earlier. And we, the focus on this talk is, is not very much the model. So I'm really just using default, default settings and training a simple regression and a simple random forest. Of course, the random forest is predicting a lot better here, but like I said, the focus is going to be on the post hoc interpret interpretability methods. And with that, I'd like to look at the first one. I don't know how much, how much you've heard about that in the previous talk. Um, but I'm just going to go over it. Nonetheless, the permutation feature importance, you can think of it as as a model agnostic version of the feature coefficient of the standardized feature coefficient in the linear regression, or maybe the p-value if you're more of a statistician. And what the feature importance does is, is that it measures the importance of a single feature for the predicted outcome. So how much or how important is this feature for the accuracy of the, of the final prediction? And the nice thing about it is that it automatically captures an interaction effect as well. So if the effect of one feature is highly dependent on the, the value of another feature, this is captured as well in the, in the final value of the importance. Uh, you may have seen this method in, in the Random Forest paper by Breiman. It's been out there since 2001. And the basic idea is that you look at one column or one feature that, you, that you're interested in, for example, the temperature, and you just predict the outcome using your original data set, and then you play with your data set. You just shuffle this one column. You just randomly permute the temperature and send it through your model again. And then you get a second set of predictions, which are a bit worse, I would guess. And then you take the difference between these two losses. If you have a informative feature like the, the temperature, the permuted data set is going to perform that a lot worse. And if you have a random column, if, if it's just random numbers, then permuting it wouldn't change anything. So by that difference between the losses, you're going to see how important this one feature, this, this one column is for the final prediction. And of course, you're not looking at each observation itself, but in the fifth step, you're computing an average. So over your entire data set, how much did the prediction suffer if you if you manipulated this one feature column? This is how you can do that in Python. There's a package called ELI5. And if you're on Reddit, uh, you know what that means. It's explained like I'm five. So the idea is to break something down into, into very simple terms that, that it's easier to understand. Uh, you call it with a syntax similar to scikit-learn. And then with this show weights method, you're going to get a table like this. And ordered by importance, you have all of these features here with, with their importance here. You're going to see in this example that the year is very important or very informative for the final prediction. And like I said, the reason for that is that this was a startup company that was growing heavily between 2011 and 2012. The next important next most important feature is the temperature so of course if it's warmer or if it's summer we rent out more bikes um, the humidity is also very important the temperature that you feel even though it's probably highly correlated with the temperature right it's still very important or informative and so on you'll see there's 13 more but the the main ranking of those is probably more important now, if you think back to, to the first problem, the one of fairness, um, Amazon and their CV classifying algorithm, which discriminated uh, with gender, gender bias built in. If you look at that, you can see that the, the feature importance can handle this problem. It can solve it because now you can see how much a feature contributes to the predictions. And if you run this on a CV classifier and you see that the gender is very high in this feature importance, you're going to have to go back and, and think about your model, retrain it or swat, switch out some, some features maybe. So to sum up, the, the permutation importance is a very nice way to, to solve this first problem, right? Okay, 
let's look at the second one. The second method um, I would like to present is a partial dependence plot. And you can think of that again as a model agnostic version of the something of the linear model, in this case, the actual feature coefficient. And a PDP measures the effect of one feature on the predicted outcome, just like a feature coefficient does for the linear model, the, this beta j, for example, the partial dependence plot is doing a similar thing. And that was first described in the gradient boosting machine paper by Friedman also in 2001. And the algorithm is easiest to explain for a categorical variable, so for a, for a factor feature. What you're doing essentially is that you're picking out a single feature, for example, the season, and you force your entire data set, so all of the data, not just the winter, but the entire data set, you force the entire column to winter, and then you send it through your model and predict the, the outcome. And then you average these predictions. Then you do the same again. You force the entire column to be summer, spring, and autumn, and so on. And you predict the outcome again. And then you're going to see something like this. Here I'm doing it manually in Python. Um, I just skip that because I have the same this information here in a bar chart on the next slide. And here you're going to see that this is a partial dependence plot for a factor. Um, for a factor variable, yeah, and you're going to see that the effect of spring is that you have an average of 4,000 bikes rented. Summer and autumn, it's around 4,500, and in winter, it's around 4,800. Um, it's important to note that these partial dependencies are not group means. They are very different from that. Because in a group mean, you're picking out, if you imagine your entire data set, you're just picking out all of the winter observations, all of the days of, that were actually winter, and then you and then you compute the, the average number of bikes rented. If you would do that, you would get these numbers. You would see that in spring, you have a super low number of bikes rented out. Uh, in winter, it's also low. And in summer and autumn, it's it's a bit higher. It's highest in autumn, actually. But what you would do in a partial dependence plot is that you take the entire data set, so all the days, and even the ones with a temperature of, say, 40 degrees in, in very hot days, but you still force the entire column to be winter. So you don't get the this correlation in the So you really just get the effect of the season. And this is, like I said, this is uh, a lot different. If you had the partial dependence, you would see that, yeah, you would see highly different numbers than that. Let's look at a continuous variable, because for continuous features, I think it's it's a bit more visual. It's a bit nicer, the method. For the simple model, for the linear model, the partial dependence is actually exactly the same as the, the regression line. So you see it here, the temperature and the relationship to the actual number of rented bikes. Um, when it's cold, very few bikes. When it's warm, many bikes. Uh, and you also already see the, the limitation of a linear model. Of course, um, if it's 60 degrees, it would predict many, many bikes, but it's actually too hot. Uh, the same thing with the humidity. Here we have a negative relationship. Of course, when it's very dry, we, we like cycling. When it's very humid, we don't like it. And you can put those together into a two-dimensional plot. This is a surface plot of the temperature on the x-axis, humidity here, and then a plane here of the, of the final prediction. And you see the same information as in the two images before. Uh, warmer temperatures get more bikes, and lower humidity get more bikes. These plots make more sense for nonlinear models, of course. And this is the partial dependence plot of the random forest. And we see two different or two very nice improvements of, of nonlinear models here. One is that we see that higher temperatures are good up until a certain point. And between 12 and 20 degrees, let's say, it's not really a difference. But after that, at a average temperature of 24 degrees, um, this includes the, the night time, by the way. So 
the daily average of 24 is actually super hot in the during the day. And in these hot temperatures, we're renting out fuel bikes already. The other nice thing we see is that the humidity doesn't really matter between zero and 60%. It only really starts to get humid and sweaty, let's say after 60%, and then the, the number of bikes drops very sharply. And the two dimensional plot is nice in this case because it shows us there's a sort of a rectangle, which is, we can describe it as a perfect condition for, for bike renting. And this is 12 to 24 degrees and below, let's say below 70% humidity. In these days, in these cases, we rent out very many bikes. So these are partial dependence plots. And now if you think back to the second problem that we had, the one of understanding, right? You, you don't only want um, a super accurate random forest, but you also want to understand why, why it makes a certain prediction, how the features influence that then you can use a partial dependence plot because you see the, the feature effect of one feature on the predicted outcome and you're understanding this part of your model better through that. So partial dependence plot solves the second problem. And with that, I'd like to come to the third method, which I've, I've heard in the end of the previous talk also, Shapley values or SHAP. And these are a very different idea than the, the ones before. The first two methods I've just earlier described are looking at the model in its entirety. They're trying to describe the, the whole model and how it works and behaves. Um, what you're going to solve with the Shapley value is the question of looking at one single prediction of one single person. And you want to see how much each of this person's features influence the prediction, but only for this for this one guy. Uh, they have a very nice theoretical foundation based on game theory. And if you're into that kind of stuff, I can again recommend the Interpretable Machine Learning book by Christoph. And there's a, there's a whole chapter on these Shapley values. This is a link to the package in Python, which we're going to look at in a second. Um, if you want to play around with it, this is how you, how you set it up. But I'm, I'm going to skip the, the setup and the code part and come to the final or to the plot of, of a Shapley values for one single prediction. You can think of this as a problem, let's say when your boss comes to you, your bike rental boss comes to you and says, this was a very warm day, it was a perfect 15 degrees, but we only rented out 2,200 bikes. Why, why was it such a bad day? And you want an explanation for this one single day. So what, what happened there, right? And the force plot of Shapley values is very nice because you can you can see the final prediction as a, as a kind of fight between, between positive and negative forces. And in this case, the blue guys, the, the negative forces in this case, they win. They push the prediction down very low to a, to a very low number of bikes. What's happening here is that you have a base value this is the average prediction over the entire data set. So on average, on each day, we rent out 4,500 bikes. And on this day, we only rented out 2,200. And with this force plot, you can explain it now to your boss. You can say, yes, it was a perfect 15 degrees. And that actually pushed the prediction to the right. So it pushed it up by around 500, I think. But we've had a lot of negative factors also. We've had light rain, so the weather was rainy, which pushed it down by a thousand again. The year was still 2011, which was in, in the young stages of the company that pushed the prediction down by another thousand. And it was a very humid day with over 90% here that pushed it down even more. So all of these forces together and they are additive forces, which makes this, this analogy with the forces very nice and very visual. Um, all of these forces together, they just overpower the temperature, let's say, and the final prediction is, is very low on that day. <clears throat> so if you think back to the third problem, the one of explainability, we've looked at this Polish banking law where a person comes in, he applies for a loan, and then he gets 
denied or, or his loan gets rejected. And now he wants to know why. You can use exactly that method. You can use the Shapley values for this one person to explain it to him. And the plot is going to look like something very similar to this. And you, you can see which of his characteristics have influenced the, the decision away from the average. So Shapley values solve the third problem, the one of explainability. And if, you, if you're trying to decide which one to use, the answers always it depends, of course. If, if it weren't, there, was, there would only be one method. And it depends on two distinctions. One is if you want to look at the global model behavior. So if you want to understand how the model entirely behaves, then you might use something like the feature importance or the partial dependence plot. Or if you want to look at a single prediction, like this banking customer, then you might want to look at something like the, the Shapley values. It also depends on whether you want to look at the importance of a feature. So how, how important it is, how nice it is, it is to have it in the data set. Or if you want to look at the effect size of a feature, how it actually influences the final prediction. And if you care about the importance, you're looking at something like the feature importance. If you care about the effect size instead, you're looking at something like the partial dependence plot or maybe the Shapley value. Um, I'd like to take a final one or two minutes to, to talk about the future of this field. And I think we can all agree that machine learning will grow. We all like that stuff because it automatizes decision-making. And I think interpretability methods will help in that development. They're gonna play a, a large role there. And for two reasons, because one, they can convince hesitant people. They can convince the old school conservative boss that kind of doesn't trust these methods or the, the general public that has a suspicion towards this AI thing. Interpretability can, can help convince these people. And other reasons, uh, might be legal requirements. This is somewhat related to that. If, if the suspicion or if the need for explainability doesn't come from your boss, but from some law, the same idea, interpretability methods help to satisfy these requirements. And they are helpful for you yourself as well to understand the weaknesses in your models. So if you, if you run an interpretability method and you see my model always misclassifies when, when there's snow in the background, you can use these methods to debug your model, to learn more about how it works and where exactly it fails. So then you know what kind of training data you might want to get in the next step. In, in this whole development, I think that model agnostic methods are the most flexible um, or they, they're going to prevail. The focus in, in research and in appliance of these methods is going to be model agnostic methods because of that reason, because they, they are just the most flexible. You can swap them out and you can swap the models out. They don't, they're not connected in any way. And what I also like to believe is that interpretability will be automatized in the future. So like, like a normal software developer does right now, every time you commit and push something, you're automatically running a test suite and see if, if your code is still running as expected as you want. You can do the same with an interpretability. If you, if you retrain your model every month and you have not new data coming in, after that, you're immediately and automatically running an interpretability suite and you're gonna get a dashboard or an email with feature importances with partial dependence plots and with some sample predictions. Let's say if you automatically do that, uh, you're gonna see immediately if, if something goes wrong, like if your data has changed or if your model has some sort of bug. Automatizing that was, is going to help uh, finding finding these mistakes very very early in the in the process. Right, and with that, I am at the end. Like I said, uh, the, the slides are available on GitHub. I'll, I'll leave this slide open for a few seconds. There is also a, a longer blog post available at my website. And if you have any questions at the end or sometime later, you can, you can find me on Twitter as well. All right, with that,
Cool. Thanks very much. Really exciting. And thank you again for doing it like also second time. It's a round of like rich. Yeah. Um, Sorry again for that. Um, no, no worries. I mean, that, like, was, that was my no first way. time and I've, I've learned knowledge. something very important today. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did great. And that was really interesting. So uh, we got a couple of questions. Um, if you, you can, you can see the screen, right? Uh, are you sharing my screen skill? Uh, I'm gonna stop I mean, sharing. I read it like outside, so it, it's fine. Um, so, like, one is: uh, Do you integrate such ML iteratability as a step of your production ML pipeline, or is it more like exploration? And once you decide this method, you kind of because depending like how you retrain, right, and how you sample your data, right, it might also change how you know, like, uh, um, like a fairness of let's say on a gender, right, because suddenly like maybe one of the genders is not like properly. So, is it a part of your production pipeline? Or it's more like exploration as a data scientist. Um, both, uh, like I said, in the end, it it would mm -hmm. be nice if this would become uh, a normal thing in the process of developing models. And I'm thinking about. I'm I'm not using it myself in in production right now, but I'm thinking about working in on on something like that as a as a personal project in the mm -hmm. in the future. Cool. cool. The next one is uh, from Jonas, I believe. Uh, can... Will we get a similar result with feature importance compared PC. to a principal component analysis? Uh, these are two different methods. One is that the principal component analysis doesn't doesn't require a trained model, so you're really only looking at your training data. And then you're summarizing them into linear combinations. With a permutation feature importance, you're getting the, the importance of each actual feature. So in our case, the one we looked at is the, the temperature, the, the working day, the day in the week, the wind speed, and so on. And you rank them by importance. And in a principal component analysis, the you also get a ranked list of, of components in that sense, uh, in, in that case. But the first one is going to be a linear combination. So these principal components are basically um, summarizations of the entire feature set of all of the features, but weighted in a in a different way. Cool, makes sense. Um, another one is again from more from my side. Um, but so you like all of your examples. Correct me if I'm wrong. Were well, like more on a tabular data, right? You have you know, like many columns. Did mm -hmm. you also have any experience with using it like for images, right? Because I know Shopwell is definitely support images. And how do you see, is it something big or, because depending like what part of the industry you also see like more people seeing unstructured data, right? And uh, trying to handle it as well. I've always only worked with structured data. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not an expert on, on images or voice or so. So I can't say much about that. Um, I know about some interpretability methods on on image data. I've, I've shown this one image of the of the wolf. Mm -hmm. um, and let me see if I can think of something. I think no. Yeah, that was Lime. Is is a method that works with with yeah. image data. I don't know about chat to be honest. But yeah. I've, I've, Really yeah, mostly work with tabular data. Yeah, yeah. No, sounds cool. So next one is uh, uh, Philip. He says that he, uh, once he met you like in Crossroy, so he's just like saying hello. We should yeah, we did, we did, we did. I like <laughs> these um, Python conferences, the PyCon. Yeah, we met at good. 2018, I think. Yeah. Cool, and uh, also uh, another appreciation for a great presentation. Thanks. Glad you yeah. enjoyed it. Yeah, it was was amazing. Thank you again for doing it, and uh, it was amazing to have you. Um, hopefully, Thank see you, you around. Yeah, and uh, we're also going to share your links and the presentation and everything else. Okay. Oh, sure. Thank you. Cool. Cool. I think with that, um, it was like a good, almost like two hours. Unfortunately, we didn't really have like a break in between because of like technical um, limitations that we had. But overall, I hope you enjoyed um, this 
two hours of your evening and uh, it was not completely boring sitting like at home, but also you learned something from um, our local speaker, Alex from Munich and from Sarah from all the way from Boston. Um, I'm gonna share the presentation um, and links also like on GitHub and on GitHub. So uh, please stay in touch. And uh, we also have our Slack community. So hopefully like, if you have questions, suggestions or any feedback also please feel free to approach me because we're gonna make it even more exciting next time. Um, oh, we actually got another question, like Alex, if you're still there, from uh, Tatiana. She's asking, like, have you tried interoperability methods and word embeddings? Maybe it's very too late. <laughs> anyway, so um, I think um, Alex is going to answer to you, maybe in comments. But for now, that's going to be it. Um, and as I said, um, just me, don't miss our updates like on Twitter and on Slack. And hopefully see you rather soon, because now we know that it's working out pretty well. I put a couple of notes for myself to make next event even more smooth than today. But overall experience is good. So I hope we can make it more exciting. Have a good evening. Stay safe and uh, stay home. Hopefully, we can uh, flatten the curve. Bye. I stopped the broadcast.